Welcome to the Collaborative Podcast. I'm your host, Spencer Krauss. Our guest today is Chris Doremo. Chris is the principal at Doremo Design. Chris, welcome to the pod. Thank you very much. Thanks for coming on. Yeah, this is awesome. Yeah, we uh, we met a while back, and this has been a long time coming at uh, CES. Yeah, so. definitely Vegas. Yeah, Vegas, baby. <laughs> <laughs> good to uh, good to finally get to do it. It's been great hanging out with you tonight. I've been really enjoying hearing some of the stories and. I don't know. We'll recap some of that. We'll hopefully get into some new ones, maybe some knife play. Um, <laughs> should be a good recording. Very cool. Yeah, absolutely. It's been really cool. So what are some of the things that uh, Doremo Design is working on? I guess maybe that that's a good way to warm up. Yeah. So we're, like I said, primarily industrial design, mechanical engineering, design for manufacturer focused hardware product development. Um, but again, in Pittsburgh here, very tech heavy. So we work very heavily in the autonomous vehicle space, uh, robotics, robotic support. So vision systems, cameras, sensors, things like that. Um, but all with a focus on sort of productizing that high technology. So getting it out of the lab and not only developing it, but turning it into a, a viable hardened product that these companies can take to market and sell, you know, at scale. Cool. Yeah. That's awesome. So is there any stuff you can talk about, like in the portfolio, just notable examples? Yeah, of- we have two really good ones here that uh, were early clients of ours that they're not done, <laughs> but they're, they're well on their way and have, have gotten through many rounds of iteration. One uh, is a really great company called Replayer. And so Replayer, awesome uh, yeah, they are a sports action camera, which is a really big thing right now. Um and so what this camera does is a it's a multi-lens panoramic camera that stitches together multiple images so you can capture an entire, in this case, a soccer field uh, in one continuous image. But it uses AI to sort of unwarp the image and track play to uh, produce highlight reels and clips for social media and things like that, as well as capture all the data for coaches and scouts and, and recruiters and things like that, too. So but all with no mechanics, right? You know, old school, 20 years ago, 25 years ago, when we were in high school, you needed a highlight reel, you know, to send to college. Your mom was up there with a camcorder and then you had to find a guy to splice all your clips together. This camera captures from corner to corner, but using AI only unwarps the part where the play is, like the important part. So it, it understands what a soccer ball looks like. It understands the flow of the game and can anticipate where it needs to be focusing on. Uh, it understands what a goal looks like, what a yellow or red card looks like, and can start to then auto-generate clips and track individual players and send the clips to their accounts pre-formatted for Facebook or for Instagram and stuff like that so that kids can be their own best promoter, basically. That's, that's awesome. Yeah. So yeah, so Replayer is is really growing. They're working really hard. They've closed another round of funding. They are part of an MLS incubator. So Major Major League League Soccer. Major League Soccer um, only brought on, I believe it's either five or six companies, and they're one of those uh, five or six. And so they are at like MLS events with prospects, you know, 18-year-olds and 15-year-old uh, teams, these players that are gonna that are the 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 scouted, the highest of the highest caliber players, uh, as well as then working with coaches and stuff. Actually, MLS coaches to understand their needs and things. So, it's got application across the board. It's really really awesome. And so far, there are there are other players in the space, but the kind of results that we're getting out of our hardware, especially as well as then the software and the technology that Replayer is putting together, is it's really exciting. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah. Uh, another one that we're working on that's at a similar level of maturity, too, is is actually a, a homegrown Pittsburgh one, so Velo AI. Oh, yeah. Big flying Clark, Clark Hayes. Yep. Clark um, is, a, is a colleague of ours from back at Uber ATG and Aurora, where a lot of our team spent time. And we've been working with him and his team to develop their co-pilot product, which is is pretty amazing. It it takes a lot of the technology and the software that you know fills those roof pods that are on autonomous vehicles, and we've shrunk it down to the size of about two decks of cards uh, to mount on the back of your bicycle. That is, it is a smart brake light. It'll that, never work. 
it already works. It's really great. It's 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 pretty nuts because uh, there are brake lights that you can buy for your bike, and this thing with its camera and its sensor and its onboard compute um, is is identifying traffic behind the 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 cyclist is producing warnings in the ways of sound and light and communication to then the phone app um, for the cyclist as well as the the cars that around them that aren't paying attention to. So it is a, it's already proving itself to be a very effective and a very appreciated safety device, again, crammed down in the size of the palm of your hand. So basically the idea, I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, is like if it detects unsafe driving behavior, it starts flashing lights and... Yeah, so uh, again, probably a lot of your, your audience is maybe at least familiar with a lot of autonomous vehicle technology or some of the things that happen on board those crazy computers. But yeah, it is, it is. Uh, I mean, the lay person's view I think is good, right? <laughs> Just to- so this, this camera, this system can see vehicles. It can understand vehicles that are driving aggressively or not vehicles that are preparing to pass you uh, and things like that and warn the rider of this, all this that's going on behind you basically. And I had some previous experience too in this space with motorcyclists, similar statistics, I think, as cyclists that a large percentage of the the accidents that happen are because people don't even see you, right? Because you're smaller than them, they're in a car, things like that, let alone aggressive drivers or... or Texting and driving, distracted drivers. Exactly. And so one of the best ways to help is to at least give the rider the opportunity to try to avoid the situation. And so that's something that Clark's product is, is already doing for, for customers out there as we work through his different builds. That's awesome. Yep. It's really exciting. Yeah, really cool. We can flash some pictures of that up as well. Yep. Um, so yeah, no, those, those are, those are great products. Really neat. Big fan of, uh, the way that the physical design came out on both of those. Yeah. We're really happy with both of them. You know, we've, with both of those projects, we were with them since pretty much the napkin sketch. And one of the things that we've been really happy to do and, and proud of is to take them through the various stages of what their needs and what their intentions were, right? And so early days, you're making single or maybe dozen prototypes. And there's an appropriate way to, to do that, an appropriate level of refinement to design for, not only for cost, but functionality and who's going to consume them? Are they for internal use? Are they giving them to? And in the case of Clark's first cohort, they were a lot of friendly users. And so there was a certain level of tolerance was one of those. Yeah. So everyone over at like robotics factory and innovation works and things like that. Clark is a lot is a part of a lot of those programs as well. And, um, and so, yeah, it's been great to be able to step him up through these phases and, and follow along with him as well as his, as he does his work. And uh, get him now to the point where, you know, we're investing in injection molding tooling and designing custom optics uh, for the brake lights themselves and tuning in the camera and the protective lenses and things to make this a, a rugged, durable product now and not just a proof of concept prototype. That's awesome. Yeah. Do you, well, I probably can't get into that. I was going to ask about like projected orders, but I feel like that's too, too deep into there. Um. So not numbers, but I can I can tell you where he's at in the process. I guess yeah, that'd be interesting. So yeah, so currently we're working on uh, what Clark is working on what I guess we would call probably his first pilot build. So we've now produced hundreds of these units, uh, and and they've you sold. Don't consider them. that a pilot? What's that? You're still only about to pilot it, even though you've made hundreds? No, I say that that is the pilot, I think. Oh, I got uh, it. I'd say okay. that that's the pilot. Yeah. So we did a proof of concept um, prototype build where we built 48 of them. Okay. And that was, it was a proof of concept. It was made from readily available internals. It was bigger. It was heavier. But it did do the thing, right? And we were able to put an appropriate housing and mounting and product provisions to it so that it could go out to those friendly users, excuse me, and collect a lot of data too for him. He needed more data to start to work more on his soft on the software side of the thing. Yeah, it makes sense. After that worked, we went through it again and then started to work with our partners at Hellbender Inc., which is another company uh, in Pittsburgh here that we're both very familiar with. Yeah, huge fan of Hellbender. And uh, so we worked hand in hand with them as they sort of drew down on the internals, on the electronics, 
uh, introducing custom designs on their parts as well. On our end, hardening the, the housing, like I said, refining the optics, scaling up the manufacturing to now being able to now build hundreds of those units that are going to actual paying customers, uh, which is great. And now it's to the point where it's even extending beyond his immediate network so that these are, I would say, not completely unfriendly, but they are customers that they are just real customers now. It's not friends and family prototypes, you know what I mean? Yeah. So he's, he's... A little bit less forgiving of an audience. So, yeah. Yeah. But they are enthusiasts, you know, the cycling uh, community, not just here in Pittsburgh, but now he's, again, starting to go nationwide with some of these rollouts at different different clubs and conventions and things like that. So, and at every turn, he's, he's having, I think, a, a lot of positive uh, interactions and feedback. And so that's, it's, it's scaling up for sure. So that's where he's at right now. And we're right there with him. Cool. And we anticipate then hopefully moving on to the next phase here shortly. Collaborative with Spencer Krauss is sponsored by SKA Robotics. If you're in the market for elite field robotics expertise, please consider hiring SKA Robotics. They sponsor this podcast and solve some of the toughest engineering problems in the world. SKA Robotics can be found at skarobotics.com. Can I ask about, uh, and cut this out if I can't, but can I ask about HiveMapper at all? Uh, yeah, yeah, we can talk about HiveMapper, yeah. So how do you get involved in that? Um, I mean, okay, so the product, as I understand it, HiveMapper is a dash cam that sits in your car and collects data to do mapping. Um, and then from there, users get compensated in some kind of a crypto token to be redeemed for cash. Yeah. So, so we were, so through our partnership with Hellbender, once again, uh, and Brian Beyer, the, the CEO of Hellbender, he and I have worked together in the past at Carnegie Robotics. Um, and so there was a very natural fit there for our partnership. And so with HiveMapper, it was an existing company. And you're right, their business model is they are trying to build that a network of, of dense, rich map data for companies that need it. You know, not everybody can be Google and just build their own fleet, you know, of vehicles, right? And so they initially relied on off the shelf dash cameras that had certain specs that met, you know, their needs from a data quality standpoint. Um, but they were always subject to maybe that company is going to discontinue that model or uh, they're going to run out of stock or they can't afford it, whatever the problem is, right? So at a certain point, uh, they came to us and they said, it's time to design our own thing that does exactly what we want it to do. And so we were able to design, we've actually done two different generations of dash camera here. And we've uh, they've shipped thousands of units, which is really cool to see uh, after you go through the prototyping phase and the proof of concept phase, and then you do that hardcore DFM. And yeah, they're really cool to watch them get assembled at Hellbender. Like yeah, I and the, the cool thing at Hellbender that they're doing, and this was an interesting challenge for us. So one of the cool things that Hellbender is doing that I think is pretty unique is they're actually introducing, you know, a lot of robot companies uh, here in Pittsburgh, and not a lot of them actually use robots. <laughs> and <laughs> so Hellbender purposefully has stood up the ability to increase their throughput there by using robotics to assemble or at least create co-work spaces with their their technician staff yeah they're running like 20 or 30 urs right yeah and it's really cool to see uh the I completely agreed yeah the, the team there is 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 really top notch uh, and so you know it was a, it was a learning process to even for them to scale up that operation they be able to efficiently spend the time to program those work cells and program the robots uh, and then for even for their technician team, which again is like just just top notch, but to be able to coexist and work with those robots because it's not it's not maybe what you think like this a oh, magic assembly line or whatever. It's it's a bunch of work cells. You've been there. Yeah, of course. A and um, there. and uh, so uh, the the Hive Mapper dash cam was one of the first uh, products to go through that process there because of the volume, the success that. Uh, Hive Mapper was able to have, which then correlated to more volume on the build side. And then it's just sort of asymptotically sort of taken off, which is like fun to see, right? So when did it, when did it drop off? Like what was the sort of curve from starting on that project to seeing just thousands getting churned out by robots? It, it was a trickle at first too, especially as they, as a, as a startup, you know, as a, as a venture backed company, you know, they had a lot of the same challenges that all of them do. 
Um, but again, the, the success that they were able to prove and show with the products that we were able to put out starts to really trickle that. I think, you know, the initial pass on the very, on the first camera was a series of months, you know, singular months. But again, we went to full injection molded components. We were able to keep it domestic here in the United States uh, for that and still hit cost goals and things like that through our I network mean, you, of vendors. You need robots to do that, I think, in the U.S. with our labor rate. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but even the actual components, right, like injection molding and things like that, we used a, a vendor of ours that's, I mean, you could drive there. It's in Ohio. You know what I mean? We'd have to it's go awesome. to China for it. Uh, and they were excited about it, too. You know, they were traditionally, um, you know, as you get into Ohio and Michigan, you're dealing with a lot of like automotive industry business and things like that. And they're excited to work with companies like us to sort of diversify their portfolio, sure, but also just subject matter wise. They understand like what's happening in, in quite frankly, Pittsburgh, <laughs> you know, to to take this off. And they want to be a part of it, too, with with their whatever their forte happens to be, whether it be injection molding or casting houses or painting places that we de- deal with. They they see what's going on here and they 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 want to partner with companies like us to help yeah, to bring sense. that stuff forward. It's cool. Was the annular heat sink, like, did you have to do with that? Like the little honey dipper looking thing? <laughs> yeah, that's what we called it, the honey dipper. So with a lot of the stuff that we work on, uh, thermals is a, big, is a big deal, right? So one of the specialties of a lot of the devices that we work on is onboard compute. And that takes a lot of power, and power is heat uh, after you do the, the work that it does, right? And so uh, it turned out that this ended up needing a heat sink that – continued to also grow as we fi- <laughs> as we learned how much power it was really using up and you know a lot of the form factor was already in place and yeah it kind of took on this beehive honey dipper shape and that's what we sort of affectionately called it like obviously hive mapper their logo is a little honeybee uh and so it it gave us an opportunity to do, put like a little cute thing on the back side of it yeah yeah that's awesome yep no, it's, it's a sweet product. It's fun to watch them get assembled. Um, I still need to buy one for my car. Yeah, a lot of the team uh, have one and use it. I need I need a good dash cam, and that's what that is. In addition to also, you know, mapping. Yeah, I, you know, I don't I don't have the most interesting commutes these days. So I don't think my road data is like all that valuable, <laughs> you know. But do you not get comped if you have crappy data, or like is it equal? To well, so on where I don't. At? I'm not 100 percent up on like what the current situation is. I know that. When they first started out, um, you got paid straight up because they were trying to build the network. They were trying to build the, the heat maps of their coverage areas to the point where they had users that, much like some people quit their job and they drive for Uber, people were, they told us a story about a guy in Texas that was like, he would go out and just drive around for eight hours. <laughs> He'd come home. I think he's maybe semi-retired or something. He'd drive around for eight hours, come home. His wife would like plug in the USB, upload the data. And that was like his thing, and he liked to do it, right? Yeah, but like yeah, four I, of them. <laughs> yeah. So, well, they talked about that too. You can, if you run multiples, you can get more data, I guess. But oh, that's um, interesting. I think eventually, if it hasn't already, the idea is that it's more of like a, um, almost like a consignment, right? So, if you've delivered awesome data that, like, then more people were interested in it, it you get credit, more credit. Yeah, right? that makes more sense. I mean, like the inside of my carport, I feel like is probably not that. Right, valuable. like the country road to and from my kid's school is not <laughs> that important, or I don't need to cover it seven times for them. To, <laughs> like, it's pretty much the same. So, so yeah, but uh, yeah, I, I could imagine, you know, if you're an Uber driver, if you were a delivery driver, if you were a salesman of sorts that just spent a lot of time on the road, why would you not? And you'd be in different locations, so you'd have that, better. That's data. what I mean. If you're if you're kind of all over the place, why would you not just throw it on there and passively collect it? Yeah, it makes I mean, sense. it seems. I think it's a really cool idea. Um, and uh, yeah, they've also, like I said, set up their own cryptocurrency sort of their like token system for it. You know, so um, you know how all that plays out in the end and what people do with it. I guess time will tell. But so far, they've been really successful, and especially after. Uh, like I said, partnering with us, the partnering with Hellbender, um, things have taken off. They've they've developed two bespoke camera solutions uh, that have both proven to be very good uh, at what they needed to be, and uh, they're continuing on, which is great. Awesome. Yeah, no, it's happy to see them successful. Yeah. How did you get into design? Like, when did you when did you know you wanted to do this? <laughs> yeah, I discovered industrial design at Carnegie Mellon University. So. Uh, I started at Carnegie Mellon as a mechanical engineer. Uh, growing up, 
I was always good in math and science and I took physics and calculus in high school. I like to build things. Um, but you know, it was pre internet. My dad wasn't an architect. My mom wasn't a designer. I didn't, didn't know about it. I didn't know about industrial design. Uh, when I was at CMU, you know, you meet people, the CMU was just really starting to push their sort of interdisciplinary collaborative efforts. So the mechanical engineering department, the ID department very much, you know, align in that fashion. And that's how I discovered it. I was like, this is awesome. You know, and so basically, I I lived with a foot in each door, then for the next four years. Oh, cool. uh, uh, but I did actually like reapply to the the design department, got accepted, uh, and so you know got my degree actually from there with a minor uh, in the engineering department. But there were still professors. I remember my senior year, I went to a class and the engineering professor didn't realize that I wasn't in the engineering department because <laughs> I was still seen very often. So that's that's our style i guess that's that's our flavor of industrial design if anyone that's worked with design departments or even individual designers there's a lot of different directions you can go with that skill set there's a lot of different skill sets that you can develop too yeah for sure obviously like with everybody else you know with the level of experience i mean uh between our team members you know we've we've been around the block a few times uh and again especially in the most recent history in the last like five to ten years here in pittsburgh uh, we've worked at or for a, a large number of the autonomous vehicle companies, the major robotics companies, um, and their supporting companies as well, sensors, cameras, things like that. And we understand what the challenges are. And I think that we also have, uh, I think, the temperament too to hang with this craziness that is the startup environment as well. Um, you know, we understand that for these teams they've got their livelihood on the line very often right not everybody's rolling in a, a billion dollars in investment what they're doing is sleeping on the couch and not taking a salary for two years while they try to get their dream up off the ground wonder what that's like <laughs> yeah <laughs> and how many kids do you have when you do it <laughs> so it's and that's that's cool right that's that's a lot of different people's dreams and you know, for us, we try very hard to be teammates and stewards of of their resources, of their efforts there. You know, obviously they, they come to us sometimes with a, a, a conception of, of what it is we do or what we can do. We try very often to, to share and offer up as much uh, advice and support as we can in, in all aspects and uh, try to absorb and understand what they're what their goals are because it's it is their company it's 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 not ours right and so for that time that we're hopefully engaged with them that's how we have to act you yeah know? and so uh you know as if we were part of that team you yeah know? and it's sure. and we're as, as as invested at least emotionally <laughs> uh as it is and that's how we like that's how we like to conduct our business yeah that's cool yep. I, i'm definitely excited to figure out a way to work together <laughs> yeah yeah it'd be great yeah yeah. So when you're thinking about design a thing, like, I guess, I'm sure it's different depending on the product. I mean, you talk about a holistic approach, but like, what do you look at first? Like, do you try to profile the customer? Do you try to understand the customer journey? Do you try to look at like day to day interaction? Do you try to look at unboxing? Do you try to look at like, you know, how they throw it away? All of the above? Well, you mean in in now technically, you know, in this line of work as a as a as a consulting firm, uh, as I said before, it, it's it's the client's company, right? So we tr we first start with them. We have to understand where they've been, how they've gotten to where they are. Have they done any kind of that work? Are there preconceived issues? Are they looking for help to understand those issues? Uh, maybe they're not. Um, so it really depends where they're at in their lifespan or that makes a lot their of sense. their immediate That's goals. Similar to SK's business model too. You know, right. I mean, you have to. Right. Um, you can't push something on them that they're not. You know, unsolicited advice. <laughs> yeah. Right. At the same time, I mean, people are smart and people understand these things and, and within the realm of what's possible, whether it be budget or timetable or whatever, they want it. Most, most clients do. They, they want their product to be as, as great as it can be. And so sometimes you have to teach them a little bit. You just talk to them a little bit and again, be that teammate that comes to a consensus. Like, okay, well, what's the appropriate amount of work to do right now? And then, what we like to be able to do, we think that we're pretty good at, is to 
since we've been around the block and we've been through, again, the early phase companies and projects, and we've taken them all the way again to full scale production, injection molding, you know, more mass production, we're able to kind of put on our different hats at different phases and anticipate some of this stuff and, and ask them tougher questions or point out things that are like, hey, we know you don't really think you want to talk about this right now, but you'll be a lot happier if we at least touch on it and acknowledge and let's build a, a slightly more cohesive, a slightly more stable plan moving forward. It doesn't mean you can't change your mind. doesn't mean you won't change your mind. Uh, but at least in three months, you won't get mad at us when this thing pops up that we kind of knew might happen. So that makes sense. So it's a really long answer, <laughs> to a really non long non-answer to your question, but it really just, it, it depends. You know, I think we like to start, you know, we don't start with the unboxing. That's, that's the nice putting a bow on it at the end. And that's, <laughs> that's all the dessert, you know, <laughs> to, to yeah. the meal. We do, because they are real products and they are real companies that are trying to get these devices or these products out in space, we have to make sure it works, right? So we really bear down on the technical and understand uh, what it is. Because a lot of these projects that we take on are extremely technical. Um, and then right next to that is the, okay, who's using it? Uh, well, who's Maybe who's responsible for buying it necessarily? Like, for example, um, the replayer camera. The customers, it's not every parent for every student or every player is going to buy one of these cameras the team might, or the league might, or the organization might. And then the the users are all gonna have their app and they'll pull their footage, right? So not everybody buys a camera. You just like send it a picture of your kid and it's like, all right, there's a reel with just Timmy in it. Yeah, basically that's, that's how you cool. can do it. <laughs> that's the goal basically. You, you don't, yeah, yeah, you don't need the pics of your Screw neighbor. Stacy, we don't want to see her. Just Timmy, <laughs> right. Timmy, and all the shots. <laughs> so there's or Timmy's those are, face on the other kids. <laughs> those are different customers, though, right? Like the the organization leader, and then the experience for that parent uh, is different than maybe say the high school player who he's handling his own business because he's 17, he has a phone, whatever. Um, and so we we try to understand that, and not make any preconceived assumptions, I guess. Uh, and then two, everything about it, the life cycle of the product. So maybe a service technician at their company or in the case of an autonomous vehicle, maybe whatever their service situation is or the upfitter, the builder of it, they're a customer of your work at some point. You put something together and then you handed it off and they have to do their job. They have to do their step in the process based on what you gave them. You need to understand that to a certain extent. Yeah, it makes sense. Yep. I, mean, I spent some time with a company where we had our own factory uh, for the product that we made. And so it wasn't startup -y, it wasn't exploratory, but it was more about efficiency and stuff like that. And you do, you have to lay down your ego and just, I had preconceived ideas. I, I knew a thing or two. I wanted, I had suggestions on how we should run things, the handoff, say, between the engineering and the design department and then the, the factory. But ultimately, you know, our head of manufacturing, he was my customer. It's like, here's this thing I deliver to you so that you can go do your job. What do you want it to be like? I've got some ideas. Let's talk about it. And that's something I talk about with our clients and even our employees, our teammates is, again, having been at different companies on different teams and sizes, like there's nothing you can't talk about. All this stuff is really important, but in the grand scheme of things, it's not. <laughs> it's, it's, it's just life. It's just work. We can talk through all this stuff. Obviously, there's a level to which, you know, hey, that's your business. Maybe it's financials or maybe it's something else, but we're here to help. You know what I mean? And again, for that time that we're together, we're part of the team. We try to be uh, for those people. And uh, that's how we like to support them. That makes a lot of sense. Yep. Figure out people need to deliver it. Yeah. Uh, is there anything you want to plug on the way out? Um, I mean, this is, it's... I don't know it's kind of a big deal for us, but we've uh, we've decided to join the Pittsburgh Tech Council. Great organization. Which we're, yeah, we're really excited for that. Um, we've had some good conversations with their team. Uh, we think what they're doing for the group. I mean, the list of members was surprising. I had no idea it was it was actually that big, and a lot of the benefits that they um, you know bestow upon their members is is actually very impressive. And and everybody that I've talked to leading up to that uh, was was always very complimentary of it and recommended 
that as a next step for us anyway. And so really looking like forward to being active in that community and, and meeting more of the companies in the Pittsburgh area uh, for sure. So that's that's kind of the next big one for us. And the rest is, uh, you know, nose to the grindstone, <laughs> so to speak. We have a couple of decent uh, projects that are going on right now that we can't really talk about yet. Uh, but hopefully once they're done, <laughs> we'll get them out there and people start to see it. They will be pretty visible ones. And then Ones like Replayer and Velo and, and Hive Mapper, those are ongoing ones for sure as those companies continue to grow and evolve. And uh, we're actually trying to put together maybe some case study things where we can tell that story a little bit better now that it has kind of matured a little bit. Both uh, we and Hellbender and then those those companies respectively um, are very excited to tell the story, uh, I guess, because as most of, especially your your audience can probably attest to that, that affinity for the Pittsburgh community yeah, sure. uh, in all aspects. But in this case, the, the tech industry, the product development industry, um, it, it, you know, Clark was already here, but replayer is a, they're based on the West coast. And, you know, as, as you, our sports players say it, our uh, colleagues of ours that have moved here over the years, like say they're from Pittsburgh now, like, it's it's contagious. Yeah, you don't on have to be levels. ashamed of it anymore. Like it, it used <laughs> well, to be, like yeah. be like I, I'm from New York. <laughs> like, <laughs> but it's um, and that's cool, and it, it it gives you something to be proud about. We're proud of it. Yeah, same here. Yeah, uh, yeah. one of the guys on my team, he's actually from kind of like Philly, but at least it's Pennsylvania, I yeah. guess. But uh, <laughs> Pittsburgh's sweet. I, I love it here. <laughs> and um, McGee, baby, you know, <laughs> happy to be in Pittsburgh. Yep, yep. And uh, so it, it's. It's good. There's just a lot of great stuff. We're super happy um, to be a part of it all for sure. And, uh, you know, just trying to play our part. Sweet. No, that's awesome. Yep. Happy happy to share the community and uh, happy to have you on the pod. This yeah, this fun. was awesome, man. Thank you so much. Uh, it's been really cool catching up. And, uh, yeah, this is pretty sweet. Absolutely, Chris. Had a great time. Thanks, man. Thanks for joining us today. If you've made it this far, chances are you'll like other episodes too. Collaborative with Spencer Krauss is available on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Pocket Casts, and Radio Public. Subscribe today to get notified when the latest episodes release and support the channel. Collaborative with Spencer Krauss is sponsored by SKA Robotics. If you're in the market for elite field robotics expertise, please consider hiring SKA Robotics. They sponsor this podcast and solve some of the toughest engineering problems in the world. SKA Robotics can be found at skarobotics.com. Thanks again, and see you on the next one.